Okay, uh, once again, welcome to this webinar um, about rethinking the pathway with hockey mentors this evening. Um, sorry for the delay, a few issues with Eventbrite, it seems, and people trying to load the page and uh, log in. I have tried to email everybody, and I'm sure there'll be more people um, entering the waiting room, as I can see. Um, but yeah, this is the first webinar we've done this season. We're very lucky to have uh, Sarah Evans, GB International, should I say former GB International, with us this evening, and also Jack Childs, who is the founder um, of Hockey Mentors. And he's going to be telling us a little bit about the project this evening. Um, but what I thought I would do initially is just run through what All In is about uh, very briefly. And that's for the benefit of those who might have uh, forgotten or um, some new people who, who are just getting um, interested in the All In movement. So I'm just going to share my screen. Just give me a second. Okay, so the the whole point of All In was always about that if you're committed to stopping inequality in hockey, ask yourself what you've done to diminish the structure of inequality. So what we say is you can either commit to it or by doing nothing, you reaffirm it. And at All In, we came up with three A's, which are acknowledge, assess, and act. So if you see any sort of inequality, whether as a, a club, a region, an individual, or as a governing body, acknowledge it. I mean, one of the um, examples we could talk about acknowledgement would be things we've seen recently with Yorkshire County Cricket Club. I think a big issue that um, people had with Yorkshire was that they weren't ready to acknowledge some of the issues that they had within the cricket club. Um, I know recently they have come out and acknowledged it, and I think that's a very powerful thing, because if we don't get to that point, then it's very hard to get to the next point, which is assess where the issues actually went wrong, um, and then act on it. And here's our vision for a more inclusive and diverse future. What we'd like to see is an actively promoted national strategy for promoting the sport within state schools, an active education programme for regions, clubs, umpires and players on DNI on the safe, same scale as safeguarding in hockey, national coaches to engage, mentor clubs from more deprived towns and inner city areas. Um, EH board of directors to match the demographics of society by 2023. And by 2028, we'd like to see the Olympic squad matching the demographics of British society as well. And if you think about it, that's only seven years away. And by 2028, we'd like to see 50% of the GB squads coming from state schools and the national coaching set up to match the demographics of British society by 2028. So how can you get involved? You can get your club, your um, local region, even to sign up for the All In mission. Um, our website is here below, hockeyallin.co.uk. You can follow us on Twitter, hockeyallin1. Join our WhatsApp group conversation. Uh, write to your local region and EH, encouraging them to sign up. Um, and you can also socialise the vision, share the logo across social media, and even buy a T-shirt, sticker or face mask. And one of the things that I wanted to um, talk about today um, as we kick off with Jack and the, what hockey, hockey mentors actually is, is just looking at this slide here where we look at the staggered start. So we've got somebody who has a more clear path to the finish line than somebody else. And I think that is something that Jack will be alluding to today as well, that some of the young people who go through the pathway system from certain backgrounds or less able-bodied backgrounds do have a 
more difficult path to getting to the finish line, whatever that may be. So I'm going to introduce Jack now and stop sharing my screen. Um, Jack, um, what I wanted to ask to start with is what Hockey Mentors is and why you set it up. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Gomez, for having me on and, and all the work you've been doing with Hockey All In. Um, and thank you all those um, who are attending this live as well. Um, I so suppose, why did I set up Hockey Mentors? Well, if I just take a little bit about my background, I, I started hockey when I was 14. Um, I was a state school player, like um, you played National League hockey um, and did my level three coaching um, at a very young age and um, coached at Futures Cup and in National League of Exeter University. And, and I could see there were some difficulties with the current situation in hockey. And it wasn't just me who see this, obviously lots of other people could see this. Um, I mean, I was really heartened um, last year in, in 2020 when I could see some of the things I've always experienced, not only just as a player, but as a coach, um, being brought to the attention of the hockey community much more. Um, England hockey, starting to talk about diversity, fantastic movements, hockey all in starting to talk about it um, and I think it's actually an article in my hockey paper um, from one of her players, Izzy Gardner. I remember reading, I think it, she had created a Twitter storm, didn't she? And there's this whole thing about state's conclusion and it was on um, the hockey paper and, and for whatever reason it just really deeply resonated with me um, and like I'm a sort of person who wants to see positive action I don't want to be the sort of person who wants to moan or, or complain. I want to see positive action, which leads to tangible change. And I felt I was in a position where I had the connections and also the insight, not only as a player, but particularly as a coach, um, where I could make a real difference to hockey. Um, and from there, Hockey Mentors were born, was born. So what is Hockey Mentors? I think the fundamental belief which underpins hockey mentors is that every junior performance, every sorry, every junior player deserves the opportunity to fulfill their potential. So we help junior performance players, so those at county level and above, who have one of three, one or more of three key barriers to success. So they're either state school, ethnic minority or parental income below the national average. Um, sometimes one of those, sometimes more of those. Uh, and we believe that they have three key barriers to success in hockey. Um, so we help those players fulfill their potential. How do we do that? So we have 90, sorry, 100 junior players um, from around, ooh, I think it's like 58 clubs around the UK signed up to the Hockey Mentors Academy this year. So what that involves is a two day in-person day at the start, where it's all about connection and, and getting to know each other and just playing lots of hockey. Um, obviously, because everyone's a performance player, the standards just naturally good as well. We then have an online programme through the season, which includes life skills, tactical sessions and guest Q and A's. Um, of those 100 players, 32 are also lucky enough to get one-to-one -one mentoring. So in our mentor team, we have nine GB internationals, 11 GB EDP players, um, and the other 12 mentors have all played um, some form of international hockey, some senior uh, and some junior. So we have this online programme, which runs from September to March. We then have another two, um, two days all together where it's all about connection, um, all about fun and just like at the end of that, that part of the journey. And then in the summer, we have um, four times two days, so eight days in total uh, of performance camps. Uh, where again, obviously, it's about connection and fun, but we're really starting to coach fans. So it's about developing the players um, from a technical and tactical perspective to support the wider psychological and, and life skills work we've already done. Um, with the online sessions. So to sum up what I've just said in, in two words is, sorry, three words, 
is it's a talent development program. Um, and it's a talent development program which helps junior performance players with barriers to success. And Sarah, you've obviously got involved as a mentor. What attracted you to do so? Um, yeah, so for me, hockey mentors, and obviously speaking, speaking to Jack for the first time about it, um, it really resonated that there was two key things that are really important to me. And um, firstly, that's um, to help our sport become more inclusive and to give more opportunities to kids that have barriers to success. Um, and then the second being really looking at the, the mental side of the game and um, tapping into that athlete welfare side. Um, so for me, my hockey journey was, I was very fortunate that it was relatively plain sailing through the, the talent development system. And I was very fortunate to have a, um, a really good support system around me. And my mum was a counsellor, for example. And so she really understood the sort of the mental side um, and would help me through lots of different things and experiencing non-selection for example and just um you know all of the things that you experience whilst going through hockey and the, the higher up levels that you get the more stresses there are potentially the more pressure there is um and actually reflecting it wasn't until the sort of under 21 team or even the senior team that I actually experienced any sports psychology support or performance lifestyle support um and I've seen so many really talented kids um, or players that I've played alongside not make it into the senior team and potentially could have really benefited from um, from some of that, that kind of support off pitch or just dealing with the pressures that come with um, performance hockey. Um, so whether that's, like I said, dealing with setbacks, um, non-selection, um, being able to cope under pressure and perform under pressure, knowing what your value is, um, what your strengths are most importantly, um, and building confidence and resilience and the more that you understand your strengths um, and you're gaining confidence from within yourself you're then more able to cope with those setbacks and make it through uh, the, the talent pathway essentially so I think those two things uh, really resonated with me um, when I first spoke to Jack and yeah really excited uh, to be on board and as a the sort of lead mentor from the female side um, I'm also there to help train up the other mentors um, help them understand, give them confidence in themselves um, of how they can go about the program, helping their mentees um, and just be there as a support network for them as well as um, being a mentor for um, the kids that are in the program. I think that's a really important point that a lot of people wouldn't have necessarily thought of the mental or the psychology of maybe not getting selected at an early age. Um, a lot of people might see that as their only shot and once they get rejected once and then that's it um, they just don't know how to deal with that uh, rejection so to speak and having somebody on board like yourself who has been through it you know has, has played at the highest level to help them through that I think is really really powerful now uh, Jack a lot of people uh, might think that this is like your your business but um, I'm surprised to find out that this is a, a non-profit organisation. From what you alluded to earlier in your introduction to what Hockey Mentors is, it seems like a lot of work. So, so why are you doing it? Sure. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, it does seem to be the sort of subtle assumption sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, it could be a business or anything, but it's, it's a CIC, so Community Interest Company. Um, and I've actually done it on a, a completely voluntary basis. Um, and the reason was, I, I think, I just wanted to see something change. I know it's sometimes hard for people to grasp their head around because they're always looking for ulterior motives or, or different things. I, I just generally, like deep in my heart, really wanted to something to change because I had like such a profound love for hockey as a coach, um, and quite a lot of difficult things, you know, happened on my coaching journey, um, which I think was sort of sometimes linked to the you know, maybe background I, I came from and then I saw things which just didn't sit comfortably with me when players weren't able to really be able to fulfil their potential. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to make a difference. And again, it's like, you know, it started from a small idea. It was initially just going to be 16 kids and we're going to have um, 16 mentors. 
And as the momentum built and built, it just became a bigger and bigger thing. Even when we launched in April, like I made a lot of evolutions from it based on that. Um, and the more you, you hear the stories of these junior players, and the more you really start to deeply understand how our talent development system really works, it's actually just added you know, um, fuel to my fire and it makes me even more determined to, to really make a change. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been difficult. I mean, to give you some ideas, I set this up when I was actually on furlough. So I had to like invest my own money to, to start it. Um, you know, cause I wasn't exactly, you know, flush for money. So it's, I had to invest my own money, it was my own risk. And, and, you know, it's, it's taken hundreds of hours. It, it was literally a full-time job for the first few months. And even now it's a, it's a you know, it's a, it's a proper part-time job. Um, but, but I believe it's worth it because I want, you know, I want to see a, a real change. I think what was really important about what you just said was you've understood where the evolution needs to take place. You've started something and you've learned as you went along. And I think sometimes we get in the habit um, and we see this maybe from an NGV point of view or in the regions that people are very, very scared of making mistakes. The thing is this, isn't an exact science and I think that we all have to recognize that that kids develop in different ways and players develop in different ways and learning and iterating the process is is, is so powerful yeah no I couldn't agree more it's having the you know you just got to act really I think that's the biggest thing which always stands out to me I think you know it's obviously fantastic for England hockey of committed to the diversity um, and there's a lot of talk or seemingly a lot more talk in hockey about it. But, but I think when you really strip everything away, it's my question is all, always, well, well, what's the action? Like, what are we, what's actually going to change? Because I'm not interested in words. I want to see, you know, real tangible change. To think. That work. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things looking at the, the new talent development system, and this is to both of you, England hockey of, of begun to acknowledge in some respects that talent does develop at different rates and times. So would you see that as a work in progress and something that what you're doing fits in with, with that? Yeah, I sure Sarah can um, expand on some sort of from her experience, but it'd be good for, if I'd quite like just to, yeah, just to explain how I, I view the new talent development system. Um, First of all, yeah, Hockey Mentors is it's complementary. It's, it's not competing with the talent development system. It's there to ultimately, if I'm being really honest, provide what I don't feel the talent development system does. So it's there to support and enhance because it's absolutely you know, amazing all the work that private schools and certain influential clubs do to develop players in this country. Um, but ultimately, we need alternative or other mechanisms which also allow players to develop in other ways as well. So it's not like a either or situation. It's a win-win really. Um, and, and just on the talent development system. So that I just want to just share some details around that. So, so England Hockey have said there's the six key pillars of this new talent development system. And one of the key pillars as follows, I just got it in front of me, so I'll just read it. So one of them is greater diversity throughout. So it's like, this is one of the key pillars of a new talent development system. Uh, and how they explain that in my document is finding and developing more talented players from many ethnic and social economic groups. Work is required to remove barriers which inhibit inclusivity and progression. So it's it's one of the pillars of a new talent development system, and we have to be realistic. The old talent development system was very exclusive and very much favoured a certain demographic of society. And you can see that in, in the NAG squads with the immensity of players and, and even more poignantly, the percentage of players in private schools in the, the boys under 16, 18, it's around 60%. Generally, in the girls, 80, 85%. Uh, and what we have to realise within that is that actually only 6.5% of children in this country go to private schools. So the disproportion is, is like absolutely phenomenal when you, when you really understand it. So we've got this problem, and I think people, everyone acknowledges that. And it's not the private school's fault. What they're doing is fantastic. It's just that we haven't developed players in other ways. So 
we, we've got this problem and this is what the old talent development system has created. So we then have a new talent development system. And one of the pillars is supposed to be greater diversity throughout. And I have to be very diplomatic how I say this, but the impression I get was we did this new talent development system and there's many positives and many good things about it. But it's then almost like we had to, you know, we've got all this diversity going on. So we then had to pull it as a pillar as well. Because when you, I'm not going to go into full details, I don't have time. But when I think when you really strip things away, there's very little in the new talent development system, which is going to really lead to greater diversity in our sport. And it, England Hockey have answered a question on this on their own website. So I'll just read this. So the question is, how will the new talent development system increase diversity in junior talent development? So this is what they say. We are, term we are determined to grow the diversity of the sport, particularly from an ethnic and social economic perspective. We do not have all the answers yet, but we want to think creatively, creatively and radically about this. And I'll come back to that in a minute. By working with a variety of stakeholders, we see targeting issues come into fruition with clubs and schools. We need to see more frequent and high quality contact time outside of the independent school sector and robust selection processes. In addition, we need to think very carefully about the future location of centres of excellence, ensuring they are well um, positioned and accessible to all. And I just want to just go over, just pick out three or four key points in this. So the first thing is, it's again, what in hockey are doing with this new pillar is fantastic. And it does take a lot of courage as an NGB to, you know, commit to this change. It's not easy. But they're saying, admitting we don't have the answers. Uh, and what I'd share is, you know, hockey mentor can be a big part of this answer. And I think it's, it's fair to say there's a lot of creativity and radical thinking going on with hockey mentors. The second point is there's seemingly this obsession with always focusing on clubs and schools. And what we have to realise is that there's been work going on to try and increase diversity, you know, like going into state primary schools and other things for the last 10 or 15 years, but it didn't necessarily translate through to junior performance hockey. Because what I found from personal experience is people are very comfortable with a diversity perspective of like, let's go into, you know, primary school, let's help disadvantaged um, junior players like that. But I think when you really start to question some of the privilege, because it gets less diverse the higher you, up you go in the junior performance pathway, I think that's where people feel less comfortable. And what people have to realise is it's not, the solution isn't going to come through clubs and schools. It hasn't worked for 10 or 15 years. Like obviously part of it, and there's obviously things you can do, but I really think there has to be an independent organisation which is really committed to it outside of the club and school system, because otherwise I just don't see real change happening. Third thing, obviously, about, about more frequent and high quality contact time outside of the independent school sector, that's really what Hockey Mentors is all about because obviously, you know, that's for the purpose of it. There's lots of opportunities. Um, and then we talk about these robust selection processes, and I could give you lots of examples from, from people in Hockey Mentors, but because fundamentally we do not select on future potential on any level from what I can see, or maybe slightly, but very, very slightly, because we have like girls in Hockey Mentors who are going to Futures Cup, who've probably played a quarter of a hockey, of some of the other players there. And from what I can see and the feedback I get, I don't think it's ever really taken into account that future potential. So I think it's important, it's fantastic in the hockey of knowledge that, but I'd like to see you know, some quite quick action on that. Um, and then the final point about these sort of locations is, again, I think it's really important to get the locations right, but we have to be realistic. And like Hockey Mentors is all about what can we realistically do? Like it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be totally equal. But what can we realistically do to make a change? And locations can help. But realistically, if you're going to be a junior international, you're going to have to travel distance. You're going to need support with that. Um, so to sum up all, all that I've just said, I just think it's it's fantastic England Hockey are committed to this. They admit they, they don't have the solutions yet. And I just really love to really be able to, pre to present to them, to be honest, like, the full vision for hockey mentors because I generally believe if remember I've done this all voluntarily and we've basically 
how to charge the players who can pay because or not all of them have financial power. So there's lots of free places, but it's basically a self-funded program with me doing a huge amount of volunteer work. If I could just get a reasonable amount of funding, like I honestly believe I could change the sport. And I can share more about that, but um, I think it'd be good to get Sarah speaking as well. Yeah, you know, you talk about it so passionately and you can and you okay. see that um, come from you in, in what you're saying. And, you know, what I like about you as well is your, your practical. Uh, yeah. you, we've spoken before, was, and, you, and you've alluded to it there, that if you want to make it in hockey, you are going to have to do some traveling. So there's no point when people talk about, all right, um, we need to build more pitches. Well, it doesn't just happen, does it? You can't just build more pitches. They cost a lot of money. And they've, uh, they've got a sunk cost because they, they lose money essentially every year because they're... And I think that's a brilliant money. example because how much does it cost to build a new pitch? Obviously, we do need pitches and stuff. I don't know. Let's say it's 250 grand. I don't know if that's... No. Well, but it's a lot of money. Yeah. Well, on it, if I could just get like 15, 20 grand of funding a year, I can make infinitely millions more impact than building a new pitch. Yeah. It, it's so efficient what we're doing as well. Yeah. If you think about it from a from a cost perspective. Um, and yeah, as you say, it's you know, it's, it's just being practical because you know, people they often people say, Oh, we just need to go into state school, we need to go into state schools. Yeah. And my thing would be, yeah, that's great, but people have been doing that for years. Yeah. And also what's really the point ultimately, because you need to sort out the higher ends of the system, because all really people are just going into already a you know, a very a system which isn't gonna favor them. So you've got to start from the top and then work down rather than what always happens is just isolated action and random points. There needs to be a real connection and it has to be very well thought through. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just going to ask, uh, bring Sarah in a second, but um, just to everyone who's who's uh, viewing this evening, if anyone wants to ask any questions, if you want to message them in the, the chat box, um, that'd be great. Um, Sarah, you mentioned earlier that you've, you feel like you've had, a relatively clear path to get to uh, where you got to in hockey. Um, you talked about the support from your, your parents, um, you know, the, the schooling, etc. Why did you feel that you wanted to get involved, especially when it came to diversity, inclusion, and, and just more equality in, in hockey? Um, yeah, so for me, I, I think in, in particular, the, the pandemic was a as for, for lots of people time to pause reflect and for me really reflect personally and see you know look at myself what am I doing to make the sport you know the society I live in a better place and I've had a, a background of um, being really interested in human rights and equality I studied history at a university and I studied um, I did my dissertation on apartheid in South Africa and how sports I asked sort of argued how sport could help uh, help ab abolition in um, South Africa. So um, I've always had this interest and just, I think, with my mum being a counsellor and always sort of teaching me, you can never judge anybody until you've walked in their shoes, which of course you can never do. So just to have that complete non-judgmental non um, experiences and, and knowing that we are um, the sum of our, of our experiences and we are also different in characters and... Um, then my, my dad's a lawyer and so teaching me you know um equality and just and fairness um for all and I think probably that sort of background has just always resonated with me and and so after the pandemic um I I took a, a look at myself and a look at the people I could influence um so I became very much more vocal within the GB women's squad and knowing recognizing that we had a platform and we have voices that um can be used for good and to advocate for change and you know for so long I was very much I think Kate said it on one of your earlier webinars about being in your own lane and I very much was you know head down trying to do what I could do to become a successful hockey player um, but actually I wanted to do more and I um, believe I can do more than just being a hockey player so I wanted to um, effect change from the people around me and then see if I could do more within the space with EDNI. So I guess that's a bit of background of sort of why I wanted to get into it. And then, like I said before, with the athlete welfare point of view, I my career was very much up and down. And um, I think there's always this notion of sort of survival of the fittest. And, you know, you get thrown with so much stuff that you have to deal with as sports people and essentially it's on you to be able to 
deal with that and get through it and if you can brilliant but if you don't then what happens to you then so I think for me I'm really passionate about athlete welfare um and so then that's why I think Hockey Mentals is um a brilliant sort of like Jack said um support system for our talent pathway um and I think we talk a lot about I think recognizing what those barriers to success are and partly with the Hockey Mentors those three things of why people um sort of who we would select to be part of the academy from a state school with parental income below the national average or from an ethnic minority and um, recognizing first of all um, what those barriers are so that then you can have the solution to it like Jack says and he's, he's built up this amazing academy and something that I think can make real change um, within this area um, and then like you said it's brilliant that we can have go out to the grassroots level and get more people interested in hockey which we definitely need to do but then you know the stark reality is that only four women of color have ever represented great britain um and like you said with hockey all in we want that to change we want it to reflect the demographics of society um so almost looking at the different parts of the pathway and saying why if we are going into grassroots why is that not um continuing on through the pathway and seeing at what points we could maybe add in extra support so that you know kids that have had to overcome so many more barriers are getting extra opportunities for support and then potentially within those selection criteria, um recognizing if a kid has had to overcome three or four barriers to get there and they're still at this level they must have some really good potential so hopefully then they can stay within the program and gain more support, gain extra coaching if that's not what they've been having from their local clubs or schools, um, then that can be an extra support for them. Um, and so it's, yeah, finding those points within the pathway. Um, and I think that's why with Hockey Mentors, it's brilliant that it's in that junior performance section so that right around the age where maybe they're getting into um, more pressurised situations, how they deal with that pressure. Um, and then hopefully with the support they can get from Hockey Mentors, that can help with them with that. And hopefully they can then stay within the pathway and make it through to the England teams and hopefully then into the seniors. Um, so, yeah, I think just recognising those barriers and then putting the support in is a, a key action for us moving forward. You, you talked a lot about um, you know, being an athlete, being in your own lane. But one thing I would say is that um, I know that collectively as a, a GB squad in the last GB squad that you're in, you made the decision that you wanted to do more about making the game um, more open and, and diverse. How did you as a squad kind of come to that decision? Because I, I remember I, I got an opportunity to present to you and I know that some other people like Riz has, has presented to you as well. So what was the, the, the thing that got you guys to, to think like that? Because as you said, you almost live in your own bubble a lot of the time. Yeah, so it, it was really around the pandemic and um, myself and Emily Dupont, who's again been on um, on with you, and, you know, a few of the other girls in the squad were really, really passionate about it. And so um, we sort of made a little working group and just thought, you know, what can we do that is tangible, that we can help make changes? And um, so, yeah, we had loads of webinars. We had some incredible speakers like yourself, Riz, Maggie Alfonsi, um, people coming in so that first and foremost, we need to do our bit for ourselves and educate ourselves and as a squad to make sure that you know we want to be positive role, role models um and to use our platform and voices where we can um and there's no good you know doing that if we haven't looked inwards first and make tangible changes for ourselves um so first and foremost it was conversations um so it was just so much more on our agenda um, it was constantly going on. We have team meetings a lot <laughs> um, and we would always bring it up of what can we be doing to make a change in this. Um, you know, it's part of our team vision. Uh, we want to inspire generations and, you know, that's not just the same people coming through all the time. Um, and, you know, that carried on into, well, firstly, with the Stick It to Racism campaign, um, being able to have that on our shirts um, and to vocalise what, what we all then believed as a squad um, and put it out there to the wider hockey community um, and then subsequently in Tokyo um, taking the knee for all of the games um, which I was yeah hugely proud that the girls did that out in Tokyo and we had lots of conversations around it making sure everyone was comfortable and just demonstrating on the world stage um, you know that 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 was something that everyone was really passionate about and wanting to hold you know ourselves account that we will do more um, and that we don't stand with any discrimination 
whatsoever. So um, yeah, I think it was a culmination of conversations and then act acting on it and just what can we do as a squad to make tangible t change within this area. So um, now that myself and Emily aren't in the squad, I know we ha they are still in very good hands and lots of the girls are still really pushing this and passionate about it. Um, so, you know, long may that continue within the squad. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very proud that, um, that the girls were able to take that stand out in Tokyo. And I know you'll be beating the drum from the outside because you're now part of the EDI board, in uh, um, England Hockey's EDI board. So I'm sure you'll have a lot to, to kind of do with that from there. Um, Jack, is it a question that's, that's come in, but um, we're going to bring in um, a couple of your mentees soon, Tiana and, and Josh. I'm just going to, but I'm going to ask you to answer this question. I'm going to try and get them in. So Barbara's asked, how is Hockey Mentors going to work with the new framework where instead of performance centres, the Talent Academy Centres of Excellence will be at clubs? Um. I suppose the, the very short answer is in a similar way to what we did before. Um, so with this new talent development system, I think there's, there's two key things to look at. You have the talent academies, which are for 15 to 18 year olds and, and hosted club, which I think makes a lot of sense and is um, a, a fantastic development. Um, and still people in those talent academies would be welcome to um, to be in the Hockey Mentors Academy, like at the moment we have, I reckon probably about 50, 60% of our players are in the Performance Centre. Uh, and it's probably even more than that because some of the younger ones are starting to, to have trials. Um, so, so the Hockey Mentors Academy would work in the same way as an extra support. Because what you always have to think is the majority of players in those talent academies will be at private schools and they be having extra support, whether it's through coaching companies or um from their school so it's just an extra support mechanism it would be for those players what i think is really interesting is the 11 to 14 year old stage so that's the stage before talent academies so in the 11 to 14 year old stage in the new talent development system there's three key ways in there that a player can can develop their hockey there's talent centers which are in clubs there's talent schools and there's county hockey and what's important to realize is really from what I can tell, it's very similar to what's happening now. So like talent centers will, maybe there'll be some evolution, but it's, you know, it's just what the strongest clubs are doing in my junior hockey now for 11 to 14 year olds. Talent schools will almost exclusively be private schools. And I did some interesting statistics in the 2019, 20 tier one competitions at under 18 level which then goes down to like under 16, under 14, because it's really always pretty much the same schools which are in these tier one competitions. The average cost, which included three or four like grammar schools where it's free. So the average cost to go to these schools was 26,000 pounds a year. So if you think about that, and this is really what the problem's always been, the talent schools will be exclusive to a certain demographic of society. And that is, again, not to blame the schools because what they're doing is exceptional for hockey in this country. But it's just to see the reality that that part of it's going to be exclusive. And then you've got county hockey. So the, basically, the problem is from 11 to 14, there's better opportunities for a certain demographic in society. So the second evolution of hockey mentors would be twofold. So we've got the Hockey Mentors Academy, 13 to 18 year olds, 100 players a year. Um, we work similarly with the talent. Um, the new talent pathway. The second, there's two key things I want to do as a next step is to have hockey mental centers all around the country to offer extra support for 11 to 14 year olds with those biases assess. Because if they don't get that extra support, then it's very unlikely that the demographics of the people in the talent academies is going to change. And you basically just have the same thing working again and again. So I want to add that extra support. And the second key thing I want to do is to be able to enter Hockey Mentors regional teams in the England Hockey Under-18 Cups, because I, it's a bit outside the scope of all this, but within that network, it's an extra development opportunity. And it's also really an opportunity often to be 
sometimes talent spotted, especially if you're coming through a little bit later. Um, so we did. I did make that suggestion to England hockey because I had a team ready to go in the under 18 cup this year, um, but unfortunately they, that wasn't accepted because with those two, 11 to 14, you need those extra opportunities to give them a fair chance of getting into talent academies. And in the under 18 one, you really need that extra opportunity to really catch late developers and bring them into that network. Because at the moment, it doesn't make sense to me why we have these schools competitions, which are completely exclusive. And, and we talked about radical thinking before. At the moment, everyone just goes school, 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 school. But I work from players and what is best for the whole thing. And if we've got this fantastic competition, why can't we just open it to mixed state school teams? And there's obviously be lots of iterations needed with that. Um, but again, it's all about that creative radical thinking and, and evolving. Um, so those would be the two next steps, centres for 11 to 14 year olds and having regional teams enter into the under 18 tier one cup. And if you did that, honestly, it'd be so, so positive for hockey. Um, okay. Brilliant, Jack. And I've, I've got a bit of testimonial for you here. Um, Amajit said, as a parent with now two talented players at state schools, um, it is difficult to understand how to best navigate the pathway. I'm constantly asked what school my kids go to. Why is that so important if we're trying to be inclusive? And she goes on to say, I learned so much through my oldest being in hockey mentors this year, Jack and the mentors, and talking to other parents really helps. So I think that's... Uh... And that's yeah, it's so important because there's two things you need if you develop. You need coaching help and you need a support network. And like part of that support network is obviously lifestyle and the mental skills. But it's also actually just knowing how hockey works. And I think it's because I was always a bit of an outsider because I only started at 14 as a pretty small club, you know, like Litchfield and did a bit of performance stuff. But I was never really in the network. And then when I went to Exeter, suddenly like coaching my men's ones when I was only 20 years old with a director of hockey, I suddenly am doing Futures Cup when I was only 20 as well. I was like, oh, God, this is really strange how hockey works. And I just didn't, you know, I, I always get it from so many different parents. They don't actually understand how it all really works because they're not in the know enough and i think it's sometimes underestimated how much that the case is unfortunately sometimes the simplest answer isn't always the, <laughs> the the answer that we come up with um and it might just be as a result of people never being in that uh, bubble from being from uh maybe a, a, a state school or from a less establishment club so to speak and yeah. really understanding the, the challenges um jack we've got a couple of your mentees sitting patiently here um josh and tiana i'm asking you to unmute yourselves thank you so much for for joining us this evening it's great to to see you both um i'll start with you tiana i mean what got you into hockey first of all uh, um, well, I started hockey when I was around seven and I mostly got into it because I saw on the TV and I thought how multidimensional it was. And I just thought it was a really cool sport where you had to had a lot of things on your mind at the same time. And I kind of like juggling things. So when I saw it on the Olympics in London, I was like, I definitely want to do that. So my parents signed me up to a club. So it all kind of all shot out from there, really. Uh, and what about you, Josh? So I got into it in a bit of a different way. So, so it was like a hockey trial at Lee Valley. So I managed to get into that. And then since then, I've loved the sport. I've been playing it since I've been eight years old and just trying to get to the first level I can. So, so what was it that you liked about it? I like the fact that there's like so many different ways you could get past people, how you could set yourself up and like just like the skill gaps. That you could improve in. Brilliant. And um, so, guys, I mean, what what has your experience been so far? Um, mm -hmm. Having worked with with the likes of Jack and Hockey Mentors, what have, what have you learned? What have you been able to achieve from that? I mean, Tiana, I'll start with you on that. Um, I just think it's, it's so amazing, like the educator experience you get whilst balancing it with 
both physical and mental sides of hockey because I think often the mental side is often neglected in hockey and it's really important for the player to improve just as much as the technical side and so far just having so much one-to-one contact with such players with such great experience and um, who have bags of experience in all aspects of hockey Hockey has been really good you can learn from them a lot and so far I think it's been really beneficial even doing it for such um, a short period of time the in-person days the tactic sessions um, the life skill discussion there's so much exposure you get to different parts of hockey that I probably wouldn't have explored before so it's really enhanced my progression I feel I can already see the changes in my hockey um, in club and things like that so it's been really beneficial and does having that actual mentor there really benefit you going into when you go and play a game and a match, having spoken to that person before? Definitely. It's a whole different support network, which you probably wouldn't have before. Just knowing that you have someone that's on your side that knows what they're doing, that's been walked in your shoes, that's been in the same position as you. is so beneficial um, if you're going into unknown territory or something like that. Brilliant. And what about yourself, Josh? How has it been for you? Uh, it's been good. So especially the fact when you have our online sessions, we're able to ask for experiences that they've uh, the ex players have already had and knowing about like the mental side that they've gone through and how they've been able to combat that stuff. It's definitely like a really good way that we could get into a positive mindset and definitely try and get the best out of this uh, the whole hockey mentors program. And especially from the in-day person sessions. Definitely meet new people, know more people that are from a similar background for me is also definitely good. So, so both of you, I mean, what are your goals with hockey? How far do you want to take it? Gianna? Um, Well, I've wanted to go since the, uh, to the LA Olympics as soon as I found out uh, what year it was. I worked out how old I was, <laughs> like, I want to get there. <laughs> so I've like wrote it down and I've thought about it so much. So I've been working ever since. I found out um, to get to that goal. And I knew that from quite a young age that I had some barriers to exist. I saw that there one as many role models in um, the international teams as um, I supposed I would have liked. But I knew that I had to work um, double, maybe twice as hard as um, other players. But I didn't think it was a deterrent. It was more of a motivational thing. So hopefully one day that I will strive to get there and well. Got an amazing attitude, and, and what, what about yourself, Josh? Yeah, I've always wanted to do Olympic and play international for England. That's always been one of my inspirations, and uh, just definitely watching the hockey from a young age is def- has inspired me just to be like, yeah, I want to be like one of them guys. And I'm all, you know, um, guys, you both you've both got Sarah Evans here. I mean, like. What I would say from, from my point of view as well is that um, forget about what you, you've seen. I mean, you guys are the future. So you're, I know you're both going to work extremely hard. You've got um, some good uh, backing here with, with um, Jack and, and Sarah there and, and all the other mentors. So just, you know what, just work hard, dream. And um, there are people in the sport who are going to really help push your agenda and and just make sure talented kids who work hard and want to work hard from whatever background have have got a a real chance of success and I'm sure we'll see you in in LA I mean Sarah have you you got anything that you might want to say to them both no I just absolutely love that um both of you just setting those goals like that is brilliant we we have to have goals strive for often people don't want to set goals that seem too far away because they don't want to fail but you know you have to strive for something and I absolutely love the fact that you two are able to just say that and go for it and I've had the pleasure of speaking to Tiana before um you know you're incredible and got such a bright future ahead of you and Josh I'm sure the exact same to you but exactly like Germage said just keep working hard and um, you've got a brilliant support network here within Hockey Mentors myself and Jack and all of the other um incredible people involved um and also just keep enjoying it. That's what it's all about. Um, we want to enjoy our hockey when we're happy. We perform better. Um, so I want to wish you both the best of luck. And I'm sure uh, we will see much more from the two of you in the future. And Jack, anything you want to say to them both? Yeah, they've both been um, fantastic uh, role models. So you're both on our uh, leadership council, aren't you? Um, like you've been really good contributors, like leading uh, 
uh, groups. We split them into four groups, like younger boys, older boys, younger girls, older girls. Um, they both, yeah, really stood out with their, with their yeah, fantastic attitudes and real desire to improve. And I should just emphasize, it's not like necessarily just like, oh, we want to, obviously it's about performance hockey. So we'd love to create a future Olympian, but, but really what's more important is giving each child the opportunity to fulfill their potential uh, and ultimately just really getting the most enjoyment out of hockey they can. Um, but that's really the, the deeper purpose. Uh, definitely. Um, Tiana, uh, Josh, thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, a big thank you to your parents as well for, for giving you permission to, to be with us this evening. So thank you. Um, you can leave if you want, or you can carry on and listen. It's up to you. Um, but um, guys, because I'm just sort of conscious about the, the time, we'll, we'll, um, what we'll do, we'll hand over to any questions. If anyone has got any questions, if you want to um, fire them over into the chat box, then um, we can try and answer them for you. Um, I mean, Jack, what, what would you say sort of the next steps are for you? I know you, you want to work with the governing body. You'd like to see yourself get some funding. Let's say that's not going to happen. Uh, as I mean, we hope it does, but just say it doesn't. But what will you... Um, we go. I mean, I think we can keep going with the, the initial Hockey Mentors Academy. So we have 100 players each year, aged 13 to 18. Um, on, on that talent development program, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, we, we've committed to that year on year, just trying to sort the four times two day camps in the summer at the moment. Um, and I think as we build momentum and you know build credibility, build testimonials, um, I, I have no doubt that um, hopefully England hockey will become more interested, and there'll be other people who are, who want to find out more because I, I just generally think it's. If you understand the full vision of what we're trying to do, it could, it could honestly could change hockey in, in such an incredibly cost-efficient way as well. Um, so yeah, so we're definitely committed to that Hockey Mentors Academy, um, and let's hope we get the, the right support to, to really take it to the next level as well. We've just got a comment that's just come through from Francis. A lot of the top private public schools will not meet the talent schools criteria. They don't offer both boys and girls hockey okay interesting observation um I'm not sure I, I totally agree but i think uh, i think a lot of them do offer it like, like you know um, i know and it's almost it doesn't actually really matter because it's just a label to what's already there like regardless of whether you know repton or whitgift or a, part, or a talent school fundamentally they're still going to be doing exceptional things aren't they to help their, their pupils and you know their, their children develop so, so it's, it's really more about creating opportunities uh, and that's really you know from 11 to 14 or even there's nothing i don't see i haven't seen anything really which there's a lot of like policies and coverage which is amazing and a very positive first step but it's like what is actually tangibly changing like because it's, it's such a simple formula identify those with barriers to success and then help them as much as possible. Um, Sarah, where would you like to see this all end up? What do you want to see happening in the next sort of three to five years? Yeah, I think just seeing, like you say, just the representation throughout the junior age groups, whether that's from state schools or from um, ethnic minorities, to be able to see that um, actually the work that is going on is having a, a tangible effect um, in the number of kids that are, are representing England or regional um, teams moving forward. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that I can get some funding and, um, and make this bigger because I, I do believe that it can have a real impact. And like England Hockey said, they want to have some radical um, creative way of thinking. And, you know, Jack's done a brilliant job to pull this together with no budget and put so much of his time into it. So. Um, I think, like you said already, how the system is right now, the Hockey Mentors Academy is, you know, listening to Josh and Tiana, is having a, a brilliant impact on um, junior players. So hopefully we can just grow that even more and that can be opened up to even more people to be involved and to have that opportunity um, and support moving forward. Because, um, you know, we want everyone to feel supported and to fulfil their potential um, and most importantly, enjoy the hockey. And so the more people that can experience that, the better. It's brilliant. And I, and I think as well, you know, we, especially from a, a female hockey point of view, we have been so successful the last three Olympic Games we've medaled. 
obviously that uh, amazing gold in Rio as well. And, you know, if that is from the talent pool that we're currently going from, imagine how brilliant we could be if we widen that up and we're utilising not just, you know, the potentially 7% of the population that are in private schools, but, but also opening that up to millions more um, across the country. So hopefully we can widen that talent pool and give support to more players so that um, more people can fulfil the potential and move through the pathways. Yeah, I think, you know, there is always the argument that, that I've heard some people make to say, you know what, we nailed it, man. We got the gold in Rio and like, you know, we've, we've got a, a medal in the last three Olympics on the, on the ladies side. And they've done that in the, the way that's, um, I guess, been most efficient for them to go through the private school system because it's almost easy because those kids are, um, have the facilities and can play the, the regular hockey. And I don't think that anyone necessarily has a, an issue with that but when you talk about diversity and inclusion and try and marry those two things it doesn't work that that is not you know the same so you know it's the same thing as putting a black square on your your instagram feed and saying you're for this when you know quite clearly there's there's nothing to suggest that you are um so like you said you know looking at the the talent that do the, there is throughout the country um just athletes that's what hockey is, is very much about in this day and age athletes there's so many kids out there who've got so much raw raw talent and like we keep saying that they develop at different ages and i think i really hope that the the governing body can start to, to recognize that jack have you have you got any sort of closing thoughts before we, we close this up um i just think it's all about action Don't I, I just think the danger of all of this is... It's her ticket. She didn't have to speak. They didn't <laughs> hold it on to her. You just take it on the chair. Everyone unmute. It was always fascinating that her angelic career is. Well, you know me, subtle. <laughs> Someone's watching EastEnders at the same time. It's OK. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just think the danger of all of this is, is we talk a good game. We, we, we create the impression that things are changing. Uh, and the reality is but they're not. So, so I, I just think it's really about being properly accountable and, and actually, I just want to see a real change because of what concerns me at the moment, I think there's not real clarity. I think there's a reasonable, but not real clarity on what the problem is. I don't think there's real tangible solutions in a new talent development system, which is going to change junior performance hockey. And I don't actually really think there's an openness to doing things in a different way and really thinking creatively and radically. Um, and I'd love to see that change. And hopefully, you know, Hockey Mentors can be a, a big part of that solution. It might be fear. That's yeah. what, I, you know, I'm, I'm being frank. I think it might be people are scared. They don't know yeah. what to I don't know they are. And this is what it is though, because yeah, I can't emphasize this point enough. Everyone is so comfortable with diversity as an idea when it doesn't threaten their privilege. And that's why no one wants to really change it in junior performance hockey, because that's where the real privilege is. Like the higher you go up, the more exclusive it becomes. And it's, it's we also have to realize that diversity, the definition I don't, of like, inclu sorry, inclusivity is different when you're a junior international player to a kid just picking up a stick, because there's so many barriers and so, many different opportunities you need to become a junior international player. So it's, it's a different ball game and we need to recognize that. And I, and I think we just actually need to look really honestly, I think mean, you've talked a little bit about this before, isn't it? Cause it's, it's uncomfortable if you really want to look. Uh, and that's what concerns me the most is a lot of talk, a lot of impression that something's actually changing. But when you really strip it away, is anything actually going to change in junior performance hockey? And, and I want to see that change. Um, and I'd like to think others do too. Um, so your role on the new EDI board, I mean, what's the message you're going to be going back to England hockey with just generally when, when you first meet, or I don't know if you've already met, um, I mean, what are your sort of goals with being on that board? What do you want to see happen? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's having a joined up 
um, approach to everything and from um, for the NGB to be able to lead on it and to enact this change. Because I think if you look at pockets around um, the whole of the country, there's some absolutely brilliant stuff that's going on and really, really good initiatives. And it's similar with, with Hockey All In, like that's trying to bring everything together, which is, I think, what we need um, so that, you know, we're almost sharing best practice and we can have a joined up effort to make real long lasting change and not just some local areas uh, are being amazing and being really inclusive and, and having great success. But how much does that impact the sort of globe of well, the, the national scale of hockey in this country? Um, so for me personally on, on the board, um, it would be brilliant to have share those ideas with the other, other members and see, you know, there's the survey that um, has gone out. So to really look at the data of, of what people have said, but, um, to try and pull it all together to be able to then have action and to make the changes that hopefully will, um, yeah, improve things and, and move things forward for us. Brilliant. Um, just very last one, uh, Jack. Um, another question from Francis. Have Hockey Mentors gone to speak to each of the clubs in the 37, in the 37 or at least those likely to lead um, as talent academies next year? Ask them how they're working with both clubs and schools locally to broaden these opportunities I see there is uh, such an opportunity to be grasped here I'd say no because it's uh, that's really the role of England hockey isn't it to be doing that like I see the role of hockey mentors is to create opportunities for junior performance players to support the talent development system but you know like who, who am I to say, say to just a club like you know I'm, I'm here as an independent organization to support the players Obviously, we want to have a really positive relationship with clubs. We want to have positive relationships with schools and, and all different stakeholders in hockey. Um, but I think that's ultimately the responsibility of the NGB to, to ensure that's happening in the talent academies. Um, but, but again, even with, within all this, I think we just have to be honest and say, do, do we really think that just because we put policies that clubs are going to suddenly radically change everything and bring everyone through in junior performance hockey because it hasn't been the case for 10 or 15 years a lot of clubs are run by volunteers it's, it's not easy um so i just can't emphasize enough the importance of an independent organization outside of england hockey and outside the club network as well again all very positive relationships but i think without that i just i don't think i think there'd be a lot of box ticking and, and not a lot of real change is my honest opinion Jack, you know, you, you talked about the 10, 15 grand that if you, if you got that, it would make a big difference. Uh, what would you spend it on? I just need like either, it, it's not about, a bit, what I want to make is sustainable. It's yeah. just, you think of me as a person, I'm basically, you know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. It's yeah. difficult. So it could be me or someone else in the leadership team, just so I can get them to actually be driving it forward. Everything else in it can be financially self-sustainable. Yeah, yeah, sure. I just don't actually... You know, it's just not really Taking sustainable. Basically, 15, 20 hours a week all the time and trying to, yeah, you know, not live off a lot. And it's, it's just that actually, like, you could put so, like, you could do so much because it's not, it's not about the money. I don't really care about the money. I, I only care to the extent that it enables us to achieve our aims. And I just know realistically, to take it to the next level, there has to be work, someone working on it properly. Yeah. So enough that it, that's all that's in my mind. It's not a, like. Oh yeah, I can earn like it's not like I just wanna because we have to live in this world. Yeah. So I just want to be able to whatever it takes to have the biggest impact. That, that's all that's in my head. No, I'll get you. No, definitely. Guys, um, you know, Sarah, Jack, keep up the brilliant work. You know, you're doing amazing things and you're gonna go on to do even more amazing things. And um, Tiana, Josh, in total awe of you both. So Keep up the good work. I'm looking forward to seeing you play in LA. And thank you to everyone for, for tuning in. I'm going to um, put this on uh, YouTube so people can watch it on the interwebs and we'll um, share it. And hopefully we can keep spreading the message of what we want to try and achieve. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. And um, good night. Thanks, Gary.